Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our bite-sized lecture today. Um, my name is Susan Smith, and I'll be helping to moderate this session. Um, before we get started, a couple of quick um, housekeeping items. Um, you, um, as an audience member, are currently muted. We will have a session in the second half of the talk today um, for discussion and questions and answers. If you'd like to be unmuted, feel free to raise your hand, um, and we can allow you to speak with our panelists. You can also use the chat function to ask questions or provide comments throughout the talk today. So I'll go ahead and provide a um, quick introduction of our speakers. And um, for all of you, please feel free to um, add in other additional information about yourself um, when we turn it over. I want to thank all of you for being here today and for sharing your expertise. Um, our first speaker today will be Dr. Joanna Stallings. Dr. Stallings is the Medical Intensive Care Unit Clinical Pharmacy Specialist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and she's also the pharmacist for the ICU Recovery Center at Vanderbilt. Dr. Carla Savine is the Director of the ICU Recovery Center at Vanderbilt and is also the Medical Director of the Pulmonary Patient Care Center, and she is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care medicine. And then finally, Dr. Jim Jackson is the Assistant Director of the ICU Recovery Center and is also a research associate professor and the lead psychologist for the Critical Illness, Brain Dysfunction, and Survivorship Center at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Um, all three of our speakers have been instrumental in starting and running the ICU Recovery Center at Vanderbilt, and we're really excited to hear their expertise today. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and I will turn it over to Dr. Stallings. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for your kind introduction. We're super excited to get to present about one of our favorite topics today. So I'm going to get us started by um, going over what PICS is and then really talking about uh, my role um, in the ICU um, to help recruit some of the patients to get them to the ICU Recovery Center. Um, so what is post-intensive care syndrome? So this was a term that was agreed upon at the 2010 SCCM task force meeting, and there um, it was published a paper um, evaluating this um, by uh, Dow Needham was the lead author, and this was published in Critical Care Medicine um, in 2012. But essentially, these are patients that are trapped in a cycle of recurrent critical illness, and they never really get better. Um, they continue to get readmitted to the hospital, and they just never fully recover. So when I think about PICS, there are really three different areas of impairment. The first being physical. So Margaret Heritage um, has done a, a fair amount of research um, with regards to this area, showing us that these patients have an impaired six minute walk test. Um, and even at five years out, it doesn't really get better. So six minute walk test is how far they should be able to walk in six minutes based off their age, their height, their weight, and their sex. And they also have impaired um, pulmonary function tests that also never um, fully recover um, to what they should be at five years out. So very scary. Also thinking about cognitive um, impairment. Uh, the brain ICU study, which was conducted by the uh, SIB Center here, so the Critical Illness and Brain Dysfunction Survivorship Center that uh, Dr. Steve and Dr. Jackson and I are all a part of. So this study um, was in 841 patients that had either um, sepsis, respiratory failure, or cardiogenic shock. And it essentially showed that delirium was the number one risk factor um, for the development of cognitive impairment. And unfortunately, one third of patients had cognitive of, or one third of patients had cognitive impairment that was similar to somebody who's had a traumatic brain injury following critical illness. One third of uh, patients had a uh, had cognitive impairment that's similar to someone that has Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, um, when controlling for uh, whether or not patients had uh, their baseline risk factors, so other comorbidities, they still found this in people without other comorbidities. And they also found that whether you were young or whether you were old, this still happened. So very scary uh, cognitive impairment following critical illness. And the third area of impairment is Dr. Jackson's specialty, so mental health. So um, the same subgroup of patients from the Brain ICU study, he looked at depression, and also anxiety um, and post-traumatic stress disorder um, in these patients and found this to be prevalent as well. Um, so a lot of different impairments in these patients following critical illness. So we sometimes pat ourselves on the back that we got these patients better and they leave and we don't really know what happens to them. Um, but unfortunately, we're finding out that these patients have a lot of long-term impairment. And this is becoming even more um, readily um, prevalent in patients post-COVID as well. 
So thinking about PICS, we, as we just talked about, we think about it affecting the patient. We think about it affecting their mental health. We think about it affecting their cognitive um, health as well, and also causing physical impairment, leading to decreased quality of life. But it not only affects the patient, but it affects the family members as well. I don't know about you, but if I had a family member who was in the ICU, I might be anxious, I might be depressed, and I might have PTSD as well, which would lead to decreased quality of life. So how do we recruit our patients here at Vanderbilt for our ICU recovery center? So we have um, a database um, to capture patients um, and the status, essentially, of their appointment scheduling. So I'm the chief recruiter in the Mickey's. The majority of our patients do come from the medical ICU. So every day on rounds, um, I'm running in our 35-bed um, medical ICU. I'm looking for patients um, that have what we think are the biggest risk factors for the development of PICS. And I'll um, go more into that in just a moment. Moment. So I'm specifically looking for patients that have had sepsis or acute respiratory distress syndrome or those that have had um, delirium. Uh, and so I'm collecting those and I'm sending them to one of our nurse practitioners. Um, and right now I'm actually sending them to Dr. Steven because one of our nurse practitioners took a different position. But she essentially is uh, collecting these patients in a database um, so that we can keep track of them. So um, she would review the chart and make sure that the patient um, is an appropriate um, patient for the clinic. And then uh, we would essentially follow the patients through the hospitalization so that we can make uh, an appropriate appointment for them when they um, are discharged from the hospital. So when we think about our inclusion and exclusion criteria, like I said, we're primarily looking for patients that have either had sepsis or acute respiratory distress syndrome. So like I mentioned before, you all know yourselves how many people or patients, I should say, that have had COVID um, and develop either sepsis or um, ARDS. So we have a lot of patients uh, coming to our patients uh, or coming to our clinic post COVID right now. And then with regards to secondary criteria, we're thinking about patients that have had delirium for more than a couple of days, those that have been on neuromuscular blockers or high dose steroids. Once again, we're seeing a lot of this with COVID. Those that have had longer ICU courses, so more than a week, those that have multiple new deficits at discharge, and um, those that have had um, a prolonged course of shock or those that have new organ dysfunction with prolonged recovery that end up being in the ICU for a long period of time. When we think about um, exclusion criteria, um, those that have pre-existing dementia or cognitive de deficits, we might not be able to help as much. Um, those with life-limiting illness with anticipated life expectancy, so less than six months, um, we pro they probably aren't the best patients for us to see as well. Um, those that have been managed by and primarily by a different subspecialty service, so maybe like a stem cell transplant patient uh, would be an example of someone um, that we might not see because they have someone that is very closely monitoring their care. Um, someone whose primary dose is in the ICU, but um, special resources are in place um, following the hospitalization. So this could be a different type of transport. Um, transplant patient would be another example, or somebody who's a long-term resident in a skilled nursing um, facility or a long-term care facility um, would be people uh, that we wouldn't obviously be able to change their uh, medications or um, refer them to other providers as easily. So this wouldn't be people um, that we would typically see. So when we think about patient scheduling, so we have a dedication or dedicated appointment schedule. So this is the schedule for the pulmonary clinic. Um, so they are notified um, when the clinic visit scheduling is needed. Um, and then the, so we want to arrange for our outpatient follow-up before the patient's discharge because it's just easier to follow them versus having to contact them after their discharge. So, um, and we're also to have tracked the reasons that um, patients and families um, state for declining to schedule an appointment, um, just because we have things that might help us with regards to our scheduling in the future. And typically, reasons we might see would include uh, somebody thinks that uh, they already see too many doctors, or maybe they don't um, completely understand what the post-intensive care clinic is. So that's why we try quite often to see these patients before they leave the hospital and kind of explain that to them, maybe give them a pamphlet um, just to help uh, facilitate and to um, help them understand the importance of this clinic. And then also um, before we had telehealth, which uh, Dr. Steven is going to speak about in just a moment, uh, then also patients that live far away were also uh, less inclined um, to come to the clinic as well. So that um, essentially is to give you, or the purpose of my talk was just to give you the background of PICS and then also uh, to tell you uh, how we uh, find our patients and how we get them to the clinic. So I'm gonna turn uh, this over to Dr. Steven, who's gonna tell you specifically about what we all do in the clinic.
Great, thank you, Joanna. And hopefully you'll be able to see my slides here. Um, <clears throat> okay, and I'm gonna talk about a day in the life of our regular clinical practice and ICU recovery clinic. Um, if I can learn how to advance the slides. All right, so um, as Joanna mentioned, we are very focused here in the ICU on getting people to recover from critical illness. And um, rightly so, we've spent a lot of uh, time and effort and money in the critical care field trying to figure out how to improve mortality from critical illness. And we're doing a pretty good job in that mortality from critical illnesses has continued to improve since the inception of critical care. Um, but, of course, for the patient, leaving the ICU is not the end. After they leave the ICU, they're stabilized um, on the ward and then they get ready to go home or possibly to inpatient rehab. Some patients will go somewhere else like long-term acute care or skilled nursing. Um, but what happens after patients leave the ICU is a little bit fuzzy to us sometimes as intensivists. And then once they actually go home, um, our uh, involvement in adjustment at home and late community adjustment and adapting to any new deficits that they may have is of course completely off our radar as intensivists, especially if we're not seeing patients back in clinic. But this has really uh, left patients in kind of a tight spot. Um, I think it's really well illustrated by Nancy Andrews. She's an artist. Um, who herself survived a critical illness and did a fantastic uh, series of drawings related to her experiences with delirium in the ICU and, and post-ICU recovery. And a lot of patients just end up in this kind of metaphorical black hole between leaving the intensive care that they receive in the hospital and the home environment uh, where they might not really have any sort of transitional care before they follow up with their primary care physician assuming of course that they have a primary care physician, which many people do not, especially young previously healthy people who um, have a catastrophic uh, critical illness like we're seeing quite often now with COVID. So there were a couple of things that had been discussed as potential patches for this fragmentation in the healthcare system, this unmet need. Uh, one of them is what I'm gonna talk about today is the post-ICU clinic. And those are often in, in pretty big hospitals or tertiary care centers like we have here at Vanderbilt. This is our, our helipad um, at Vanderbilt in Nashville. Um, but most patients who survive a critical illness, if they get any follow-up at all, it will be with their with their primary care physician. Uh, we don't set up the primary care physician very well to successfully treat these patients because most of the time they don't even get a, a decent ICU discharge summary or transfer summary, much less a, um, or they don't even get a hospital discharge summary half the time, um, much less an ICU transfer summary. And I think we can all appreciate that there uh, is a lot of information lost as patients move from these transitions, amongst these transitions of care. Um, uh, peer support is another model of post-ICU care that Dr. Jackson is going to talk about. And when we first started our clinic, uh, which was in 2011 and 12, um, telemedicine or electronic uh, methods to reach patients and try to improve recovery were really just kind of pie in the sky. And now, in part because of COVID, um, are really um, pretty common methods of reaching patients. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. So this is, a, this is our flow sheet. This is a really old slide. Our flow has not changed since we first started uh, the clinic. Pretty much everything else has. But this is what a typical in-person visit looks like. And we're trying to see these patients between two and four weeks after they leave the hospital and are discharged to home. So if they go to inpatient rehab, we want to see them, you know, two weeks after they go from inpatient rehab to home. Um, because when you're in any kind of facility, somebody else is managing your meds and helping you with basically everything. Uh, so it's not often a very uh, typical depiction of what your needs might be. Uh, so we have patients check in, everybody gets a, screen, a screening spirometry, uh, which is to look for airway issues, especially with prolonged intubations. We're seeing, um, not infrequently, we see uh, airway issues like tracheal stenosis after intubation. Some of the risk factors for that are diabetes, which is really common in the COVID population. So those things have been kind of running together. 
Um, but in Tennessee, we also have probably a quarter of our population still smokes and um, half of our ICU population were former smokers before they got critically ill. So uh, we pick up a fair amount of undiagnosed obstructive lung disease this way too. Um, we get patients in uh, the room and I should say we also do um, a six minute walk. Sometimes it's with the spirometry, sometimes it's separate, but we get some vital signs and the six minute walk, which is uh, sort of a, a poor man's estimate of their exercise tolerance get them back in the exam room and then the um, clinicians on the team rotate through the exam room where the patient is starting with Joanna our pharmacist she does really comprehensive med reconciliation and we pick up a lot of medication problems even though Joanna also did a very comprehensive med reconciliation for most of these patients when they left the ICU um, medical history and exam a neuropsych evaluation which Jim will talk about a little bit um, assessment of their case management needs. Do they have their home oxygen and equipment? Did they get home PT, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and then we discuss the plan with the patient and the family and get their feedback both on our care and the care they got in the ICU. Then we give them an updated med list and a plan, and we have a little conference about uh, all the patients at the end. We provide a report for their primary physician and we record that data in it database to improve our practice. So um, a, a picture is worth a thousand words and I don't have a picture of this patient, but I'm gonna just paint you a picture with words. Uh, this is a pretty typical patient that we saw pre-COVID, um, but many of our patients who've had a COVID will end up in a similar situation. This was a young woman uh, who had H1N1 uh, ARDS and had uh, sort of your typical catastrophic critical illness characterized by mechanical ventilation, ECMO, she was trached, she was paralyzed, she had delirium, she had a DVT at her ECMO cannulation site, which then bled, requiring a filter, et cetera, et cetera. So not too different from what we're seeing uh, in catastrophic COVID. Uh, she really needed to go to inpatient rehab, but she was so weak from critical illness myopathy that she couldn't move enough to do um, three hours of physical therapy a day. She was basically paraplegic from critical illness myopathy. So she was transferred to an LTAC with a plan that she would get a little bit stronger and then go to inpatient rehab. We saw her back um, five weeks after she left the LTAC. I got a message that she could walk, so she didn't know, need to go to inpatient rehab. She was uninsured, so we, we, we were picking up the tab for both of these uh, transitions. And uh, she came back to clinic five weeks later, and um, she could not walk. She had very still profound critical illness myopathy, as well as polyneuropathy characterized by foot drop that was uh, pretty bothersome, not braced or otherwise treated. She had lost 26 pounds from her baseline, which is a, about average for what we see in the post-ICU period. Uh, she had alopecia, which was very disturbing to her, hair loss, very common after critical illness. Um, I had started her on warfarin in the hospital. I did take care of her in the ICU, um, but she lost her IV access at the LTAC, and so they reverted to Lovenox, and she was still getting injections, which were uh, painful. She had a lot of bruises from that. She was hypotensive, perhaps secondary to a beta blocker that she was still on for unclear reasons, which was causing syncopal episodes. Uh, she had diarrhea, which was also thought to be a med effect. She wanted to go back to work, but she was not back to work yet. And she was not driving yet. And her trach had been decannulated, which was the only thing uh, on our list that had already been accomplished. And um, she had this. Uh, cognitive evaluation. This is a clock drawing depicted here on the right. This is not her clock drawing, but a representative one. And this is what uh, Dr. Jackson does with our um, patients. So she had a Montreal Cognitive Assessment score of 21 out of 30, which is significantly impaired. She was not able to do a, a, an appropriate clock drawing as this person wasn't able to and had problems organizing and attending. And she had multiple errors on a serial sevens task where you have to count backwards from 100 by seven, which I admittedly also find very challenging, but it's interesting how um, cognitively impaired patients will answer this uh, task. And she had concrete thinking on a similarities test. So for example, 
when asked how a watch and a ruler are alike, she said they both have numbers instead of they both measure things. Um, how are a car and a train alike? They're both made of metal instead of perhaps being both modes of conveyance. So uh, Dr. Jackson concluded that although her job is not particularly cognitively demanding, uh, she was a um, she was a cashier at a high school cafeteria. Her cognitive problems are so great that they would likely interfere with her performance. And uh, the, the physical sequela, I think, are probably the most obvious to us. This, this is clearly a different patient because it's not a woman. Um, but this patient also had um, foot drop. You can't really see. He's wearing some braces under uh, his pants there. He's still got some wounds uh, that have uh, drainage bags which are attached there. He still can't walk um, despite being quite young at the time that he came to clinic. Uh, this patient lost 126 pounds during his ICU stay, which is I think our record. Um, and this is Sarah Bloom, one of our nurse practitioners uh, who saw him in clinic. Um, the cognitive um, effects and the long-term effects of delirium, the PTSD, um, has been a problem for patients coming out of the ICU since we had ICUs and probably before that. Uh, but the COVID pandemic really brought that to the forefront. This is actually one of our patients who was profiled in the New York Times about um, ICU delirium. And unsurprisingly, if you're dealing with all these multifaceted deficits, um, you are uh, unable to uh, walk in many cases. This was our first series of patients that we looked at when we started the clinic, the first three years of patients that we saw. And of those, almost a third could not do the six minute walk test because they couldn't walk for one reason or another. Um, if you can't think, 64% had meaningful cognitive impairment, then it's not very surprising that you're not driving. If you can't drive, you can't go back to work. Um, and th these are multifactorial problems that are almost ubiquitous in the patients that we're seeing in this time period. So that young woman who with the flu ARDS, um, she really wanted to go back to work. Um, that first visit, I asked her to hop up on the exam table and she required a three person assist to do so. And, you know, I just, we were like, how, how are you gonna get to work? How are you gonna sit on a stool and do your job? Uh, she eventually uh, got a tentative return to work, trial return to work note from us at nine months post-hospital. So although there are a lot of things that uh, we think we can identify with this model of care, there's still a lot of barriers to actually creating a post-ICU clinic. And I hear about these from folks all over the country who are trying to get these clinics uh, started. This is from the CARN study, the Collaborative Assessment of ICU Recovery Needs study that SCCM funded a couple years ago through Thrive to um, it was a qualitative study over three countries to try to identify what the barriers and facilitators to creating these post-ICU clinics um, are. And the, some of the top barriers that uh, were common were lack of funding, lack of a recurring space with, in which to hold the clinic, identifying those patients, and then actually getting patients and families back to clinic. Um, we noticed this when we first started in 2011 and 12, um, and when we called patients to schedule, we first, we learned the hard way that it's really helpful to have the discharge paperwork contain the appointment information. Um, so we often would wait until we could see that patients were going to survive before calling them to schedule an appointment. And often when we called, they said, no, thank you. Um, and we asked the reasons why they did not want to schedule. And those are shown here, too many doctors unable to reach. So a lot of patients are so impaired after they leave the hospital that they're not living at the place that they gave us their address or phone number when they entered the hospital. Um, transportation or distance from Vanderbilt, which is common as, as a tertiary center, financial barriers or insurance. Some patients have no insurance, but a lot of patients have insurance that is just you know, it covered their inpatient stay, but it's out of network for outpatient care, which is a really ridiculous fragmentation of our healthcare system, um, even in the same hospital. And unfortunately, the mortality in this population is high, so some patients had, had already died when we tried to schedule them for a visit. And that was presented by Olivia Kirkpatrick, one of our uh, nurse practitioners um, at, a, at a poster at SCCM. 
a couple of years ago. Um, so in part in response to this inability to reach patients and this difficulty getting them back into clinic at this high need time, but also high, highly impaired time, um, we had started pre-COVID, we had started this study, the teleport study, um, led by Lane Bame, one of our former, uh, uh, she was actually one of our MICU nurses, bedside nurses, and then went on to get a PhD and is now faculty at the School of Nursing here. Um, so we started this telemedicine version of our post-ICU clinic in an attempt to reach this patient population at a time where we felt we could help them, which was in this early post-discharge period. And it has a lot of advantages as we're learning. Um, we, I don't have any data to show you yet from the study, but we are able to reach patients at a critical time, usually much earlier than we were able to get them back in the clinic. The startup costs are really low. And, and in fact, we don't even have to find a recurring space for a clinic in, in the case of telemedicine because I can be anywhere and pull in the whole team members from different places, which is great. Um, we can see the family um, and the home environment, which can be useful, and we're able to screen for, you know, pressing problems and triage them. We pick up a lot of medication emergencies this way, and um, I have to say our pharmacists are very busy with a lot of uh, Friday afternoon emergency prescriptions, which is when uh, we have clinic and we find out that people ran out of their anticoagulation yesterday. Um, disadvantages, we we get limited objective data. We're not able to obviously do spirometry or six minute walk testing, but um, especially since COVID, a lot of patients have a pulse oximeter so we can get a pulse ox and we can get a heart rate and we have you know limited physical exam. Um, there's still some regulatory hurdles despite COVID. So even though a lot of the regulations were loosened because of the pandemic, I still need to have an active license in the state where the patient is. So as a long skinny state, which we are in Tennessee, that sometimes causes problems because I have patients in Georgia and Kentucky and Alabama and Mississippi. Um, so some of those folks have had to actually just drive across the border so we could have a telemedicine visit, which is silly. Um, it's unclear whether payers will continue to reimburse these visits, but so far they are, and there's some promising signs that they will continue to do so. So this is our telemedicine clinic flow, which is basically the exact same as the in-person, except we don't have the spirometry in the six minute walk and we have limited vital signs. But the difference is, and this has been really interesting and I think enriching for the whole team, is that instead of us all sort of um, marching through the patient's room in a single file parade, we all are on the call together and we learn from each other. And it's really an interdisciplinary, much more interdisciplinary model, I think, than even our in-person clinic as it was designed to be um, is. So, um, you know, when Joanna is going through the meds, I'm able to click off some review of systems. Jim um, is, you know, learning about the patient and the family and the patient doesn't have to repeat as much. Um, when sometimes Joanna goes in and they pour their heart out about their nightmares and then they have to repeat everything for Jim. So um, we're liking this a lot. Uh, stay tuned. We'll hope to have some, some data out from Teleport for you shortly. Um, and I just want to show this, this slide. Um, this was a study that Joanna led with uh, Sarah Bloom, who is a nurse practitioner, was pictured earlier with one of our patients um, a couple years ago looking at hospital readmissions following what we call an ICU recovery bundle. So it's basically our whole ICU follow-up clinic workflow bundled together. So we identify patients in the ICU. They get a visit from somebody on the team, which was usually Joanna or one of our nurse practitioners before they leave the hospital. They get some written information about post-intensive care syndrome. They got a 24-hour hotline that they could call with problems, an email they could email with problems and an ICU clinic, ICU follow-up clinic appointment. Interestingly, the uptake on the 24-hour hotline, the, um, the email and the clinic visits was rather low, so we can't attribute this split in curves to that. So I wonder if it was due to just providing some people some anticipatory guidance and education about post-intensive care syndrome, but there was a trend towards fewer readmissions um, in the ICU recovery group compared to patients who just got a, uh, a brochure and none of the other things. 
Um, this is, I, I think, going to be the basis for some future studies where we really have to figure out how to reach out and engage patients and not depend on them to reach out to a very unfriendly healthcare system for their needs because they don't know what their needs are in many cases, and that's where screening is so important. And then I just want to end by saying that you know we we think a lot about how we can help patients and reach out to patients and families, but um, this is also from the Karen study, collaborative uh, assessment of ICU recovery needs study. Uh, this um, particular publication was led by Kimberly Haynes in Australia, um, describing some of the mechanisms by which post ICU programs can actually make our ICU care better. And I, I have found this to be particularly useful to me as an intensivist in the realm of prognostication. We do a lot of prognostication for patients and families in the ICU based on a very narrow scope of experience, which is what happens in the ICU. And um, just as an example, I've, I've seen several patients now who um, I recommended to their families in the ICU to, to discontinue life support and they declined and the patient survived and the patient came back to clinic. And that was a very humbling and necessary educational experience uh, for me, just to show that there's a lot about critical care uh, that we don't know COVID is a brand new disease. We're learning a lot about that and seeing patients in the post ICU clinic has really helped us learn a lot about COVID as well. So I'll stop there. And um, I just listed here some of the, the studies and groups that are uh, working in this realm. And if you have a post ICU clinic and you wanna join some other awesome people who work with post ICU clinics, uh, come visit us at Cairo. That's the Critical and Acute Illness Recovery Organization. Um, that is a nonprofit learning organization for, for post ICU care. And I will change my screen to Jim now. And hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Would Thanks. You know, oh, that's perfect. Perfect people to do this. Could, could y'all reply to Terry Huff about the... Oh, yeah, sure. We'll do. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. Wes, butt out. We'll do. <laughs> Will do. Um, I don't know, if he, Wes. Uh, that that's uh, that's the esteemed Dr. Wes Ely. For those of you who are uh, who are watching, who um, who don't know him, um, he would have a lot to say about this topic if he were actually on the call, which he's not. I'm sharing a screen which is about cedar borders around trees. I'm doing some landscaping, so I'm actually really sorry about that. Um, I. Uh, I'm uh, it could be worse. Uh, it could be. Um, I'm having some difficulty figuring out how to share my screen. And um, let you're me sharing. tell you. You're sharing. Uh, Just open your slides and then we'll. We all right. Do. All right. Let's see. Let's see. All right. Hold on. Bear with me a second, colleagues. I see a PowerPoint open there at the bottom, so I wonder if you already. You do. Have... Let's see. Yeah, see that little PowerPoint. There All you right. go. Let's see. Is that it? That's the wrong one. Is that it? No, that's the wrong one. All right. Uh, bear with me just a second, uh, friends. Let's just take a second. Maybe I can respond to the email that Dr. Ely was referencing while I'm working on this. Not, <laughs> not really. Um, all right, um, hold on just a second. I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk to you about, and 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 that is um, issues that pay, pe people encounter after they leave the ICU and how we think about engaging those. All right, let's open this up here. And uh, some of the engaging of those problems, <coughs> excuse me, um, some of the engaging of those problems we do in a um, in a IC recovery uh, center context, and some of the engaging of those problems we do in a different environment. Uh, notably, we do in places like support groups. So um, I'll open this up, and then we'll discuss. And um, again, thank you. Uh, all right, we'll make that large. And then um, we will start it from the beginning as a slideshow. There we go. 
So uh, I'm amazed actually that, that I managed to pull this up, but I'm happy. Um, we'll quickly move through issues related to addressing the post-discharge needs of ICU survivors. And this is post-discharge not only um, to refer to what we do in this ICU recovery center, but how we engage people after that initial visit. So uh, we've studied uh, outcomes in ICU survivors for about two decades. Uh, in 2001, um, I, uh, I had more hair and uh, I uh, was a little bit lighter and a little more fit. It was a long time ago, um, but good things have happened in the subsequent 20 years. And, and one of them is we've learned a lot about caring for ICU patients. And really in the last decade, uh, I've learned a lot. We have learned a lot collectively about working in this post-ICU um, clinic space and, and treating people with post-intensive care syndrome. So, uh, so let's dig in. Um, we know that people are overwhelmed as described here. And when they come to the clinic, this is how they're feeling. Uh, we engage them in the way that Carla mentioned, but for some of them, their lives have been shattered just as the glass here is shattered, their lives have been shattered. And um, a single visit to the clinic, while hugely helpful, um, may not be sufficient and, and, and adequate. For many people, it's not. Um, we've had to figure out what we are good at at our clinic and, and what we are able to do with the resources we have. And we have had to figure out what represents stretching our resources to the breaking point, what the things are that we can't do um, because of limitations. And I would encourage you to do the same. Um, I would love to provide long-term psychotherapy for all of our patients. Uh, that is something that we can't do. Um, I don't have the bandwidth to do it, and um, it is not in my interest, nor is it really in the interest of my patients um, to attempt that. I just don't have the time to do it. And you learn that the hard way. So you do what you can, and you triage um, work appropriately to thoughtful other people, and uh, beyond seeing a modest number of patients on an ongoing basis, many of the people we see whose lives are wrecked um, and shattered as the picture reflects, we send them to other professionals, often professionals in their area who are able to help them. Uh, this geographic issue that was a big challenge for us is less of a challenge now during COVID. And if we uh, continue to embrace a telehealth model of care, um, geography will be less of a concern because you could see someone in Nashville to use a Tennessee example, even if you lived in Memphis, you could see someone in Memphis, even if you lived the other side of the state in Johnson City, um, you could see someone across state lines potentially. So uh, we now have more options than we did before to treat these folks. Um, we're always concerned, this is a Mr. Potato Head, people of a certain age will remember Mr. Potato Head, some others uh, might not. Uh, I'm always surprised by how dated some of my examples are. I talked to a young reporter um, just two days ago and I mentioned the word Rolodex. I said, I've got quite a Rolodex um, of neuroscientists that I can put you in touch with. And she said, Rolodex, what, what's a Rolodex? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I have to admit, I was, I was uh, struck by that. Um, so Mr. Potato Head is here. He's got a hat with a spike on it that is, that is uh, poking him in, in the brain. Um, we're, we're at only that simple with our ICU survivors, but it's not, we're not exactly sure often what the causes of their cognitive impairment are, but we know that we need to address them and help them address them. And again, um, some of that we can do in an ICU recovery clinic, some of it we have to triage uh, to other people. Certainly one thing we can begin to do, as Dr. Steven uh, referenced, is we can begin to identify the nature and the scope and the severity of the problem. Um, and we do that. We do that using tools like the Montreal Cognitive Assessment and Trails A and Trails B and brief depression screens and PTSD screens. Those are not definitive evaluations. And, and if you're doing screening, you should be aware of the difference. You know, they're not substitutes for definitive evaluations, but they're also not nothing. They're an intermediate step. And um, if there is a meaningful red flag, it can often be detected uh, in the context of those evaluations, which is why we use them. But often um, the most appropriate thing is to identify the presence of significant problems and then send patients to a neuropsychologist, perhaps a neurologist. Um, I do some definitive evaluations 
in our clinic and um, am able to do so, but um, but you may be or may not be able to do so, and those referrals are really important. Um, the screening, though, is where it starts, and the screening often is quite accurate in um, at least describing the forests, if not the individual trees. There are questions that we want to engage with patients after they leave uh, the ICU, and, and one of those is, um, what's at work here? Is it principally depression? Is it cognitive impairment? Which is it? And that's why it often is important, that chicken or egg question, that's why it's often important to evaluate um, issues in both of those domains. Obviously, people frequently suffer from mental health and cognitive symptoms. They suffer from anxiety and depression and PTSD. They rarely have issues in only one arena, which is why it's important to assess both of them. PTSD is a lingering concern. Um, this is our image all too often of PTSD, and there's no doubt there are combat veterans who suffer from it, whose lives are wrecked by it. But um, focusing too much on this image can distract us from a very real additional source of PTSD, which is medical illness, um, the effects of surgery, the, you know, the trauma of um, being with, diagnosed with COVID, so many things. Um, PTSD symptoms play out in a number of, way, of ways. This is a quote from a patient um, named Sarah Wake. She wrote an article in, I think, the British Medical Journal that was kind of a testimonial. Uh, she said, I would make detours, this is after discharge, while traveling to avoid the site of a hospital. I couldn't watch hospital documentaries or dramas. I hid my medical textbooks and journals. I enjoyed sports, but, was, uh, but began to avoid exercise as I was terrified of breathlessness. Even certain inanimate objects filled me with fear. I still cannot bear a shower curtain to be drawn as it reminds me of a closed hospital curtain and hidden death. Wow, right? This is a lot. And um, these are the sorts of tentacles, if you will, um, that PTSD has, even if we don't appreciate it. But, but I would highlight that, that if we don't look, we often won't find. And if we don't evaluate, um, we won't identify these issues. So ask about these things and, um, and don't be bashful. I mean, be thoughtful and um, be, uh, be discerning, but ask patients these questions. Um, I'll skip over this, uh, this model, this enduring somatic threat model. Uh, if you have questions about it, it describes how PTSD unfolds in, in survivors of medical illness. Glad to talk to you about it if you wanna engage me. Um, this is a legal pad that we received from patients some time ago, uh, a patient, examples of um, delusional memories they had that were the, the basis of PTSD are described here. Sarah Margaret, a memory of Sarah Margaret, that was the patient's daughter, dragging a dead body in the room behind her, the respiratory therapist trying to inappropriately touch me. Um, so, so many things. Um, depression is a concern to be sure, and I'll move quickly here. And it's a concern in family members. So we try hard to address the needs of family members. We refer them for mental health counseling as we're able to. The thing, though, that I think is the single most helpful thing, and, and it's why this is really what, where I want to land, is support groups. Um, support groups, uh, peer support groups, have a long history in medicine of uh, proving to be effective in improving patient outcomes and quality of life. And really since, um, I don't know the year, Carla, and, and you could help me, but really since 2015 or so, um, We've had a support group for ICU survivors. Uh, currently, numbers about 20 people. They come every week for an hour. Um, we now have a support group for family members of COVID-19 survivors who were in the ICU that has about seven regular attenders, meets once a week. And in about three weeks, we're about to start, start a support group focused on developing cognitive skills for long haulers, COVID long haulers with brain fog. So um, if, if you have limited resources and you're trying to figure out where to invest your effort and where to put your chips. I would say, uh, for me personally, and it's not close, there's not a close second, um, far and away the, the, the way I think we've impacted people the most, um, that is in the, in the months after they left the clinic, people with mental health issues, is the support group. Um, they find a welcoming family of people they feel less like unicorns, uh, and, and I, I use that word carefully because that's often how our IC survivors feel. They feel like there's no one else like them. 
Um, there's not a network of ICU survivors. There's not a network of people supporting them in the way there would be survivors of cancer, uh, for instance, or Alzheimer's disease. Um, so they feel alone, and and the support group is uh, is an environment where they don't have to feel alone, where they can learn from people who are thriving, where they can be embraced by people who get it, and it's really helpful. Um, we don't charge for our support group. It's a service. Again, it meets once a week. It's led by uh, me and some of my colleagues, some with mental health training, some not. If you're inclined to start a support group and feel like that might be a nice adjunct to your ICU recovery center, or if you feel like that might be an easy place to start because it doesn't require a lot of resources, please send me an email and um, we can talk about how to help you start a support group. I can I can uh, talk to you via Zoom. I can do a training. We'll, we'll help you. Um, we were worried that support groups for ICU survivors very much springing up might not be attended by people who were traumatized by coming to the hospital. This was a good concern, but um, what we found during COVID is that people can join these support groups virtually. They don't have to go to the scene of the crime and they're, and they're grateful for that. Um, the other thing I'd mentioned very quickly is rehab, uh, cognitive rehab, uh, often delivered by speech and language pathologists, sometimes delivered by occupational therapists, rehabilitation psychologists. When you interact with ICU survivors, um, when you interact with survivors of COVID, particularly those who have cognitive problems, I'm going to invite you to embrace and, and orient around a rehabilitation paradigm. We're going to use a rehabilitation paradigm, as you know, for survivors of stroke. We're going to use it for survivors of traumatic brain injury. All too often, um, we're not as rehabilitation focused, cognitively at least, as we might be for survivors of critical illness. I don't have the time to, to get into the weeds about cognitive rehab and cognitive training, except to, to implore you and I'm willing to even beg you um, to think about rehab, rehab, rehab as it relates to improving cognitive outcomes in these patients because the evidence would suggest A, that, that it works and B, that they're interested. So um, so this is my two cents and, and I'm grateful for the time. Thank you. Thank you all so much for presenting. We would love to open it up for questions for the last, um, about, so we have about 12 minutes here. So feel free to, again, put questions either into the chat box or the question box, or if you'd like to um, ask your question, raise your hand and I'd be happy to unmute you. Um, we do have one question that came in, I believe during Dr. Stalling's portion of the talk. And um, the question is, what about patients who transfer to an LTAC from the ICU? How do you keep track of them and then schedule them for follow-up in clinic? That's a great question. Uh, we um, do have that happen quite often. And uh, honestly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carla, but I think it was like about, um, we found in our initial 62 patients that we evaluated, like we didn't see patients for like a month. Um, after they left the ICU because most of them did go to long-term facilities. So, but I'm not sure. So, Carla, you have to jump in and answer this. Is it the scheduler who keeps track of that and who helps us find those patients? It's it's very, very difficult because um, and, and some, in some hospital systems, their LTAC is associated with their hospital and that might be easier. We don't have an LTAC at Vanderbilt. So, when people go to an LTAC, they're leaving our system and going to another system that we don't have any access to their medical record there. So it's really difficult to track them down. Um, we This got so frustrating <laughs> after a while that we um, I actually ha had a meeting with our local LTAC because the medical director was one of our former fellows. And we just got in a room together and said, OK, we got to make sure that these folks don't fall off the map and um, their liaison who recruits them from the acute hospital to the LTAC um, will, will shoot me a message when they're ready to uh, to to leave the LTAC um, to get them set up in clinic. It's not a perfect system because it depends on people and it's it's much better to have a system that will continue to work even if the people who are dedicated to the project move on or get hit by a bus or whatever is going to happen to them. Um, so when you're building your systems, think of that. Um, but in the sort of old school train of thought, uh, sometimes a phone call is the best thing and just um, meeting with people face to face when that's a possibility uh, post COVID um, and developing those relationships with your referrers in the community is really helpful. 
Um, it, it also kind of depends on what happens to people when they leave the LTAC. If they go to LTAC to inpatient rehab, which is um, not uncommon, then um, that's a good time to get them scheduled. Um, one of our uh, psychologists who works with Dr. Jackson is just starting at our inpatient rehab hospital. So we're hopeful we're gonna be able to have a contact there and pick up some patients from there. Um, a fair number of patients um, are self-referred, so they find us on the internet and ask to come back, um, but usually you have to be pretty proactive, so I wouldn't depend on that. And then uh, some, of, some of our colleagues at other centers, they will, um, you know, if somebody gets ECMO, for example, they're like, okay, well, this is going to be a long road. We'll just put something on the schedule for three months from now, and whether, you know, whether that's a perfect timing or not, at least we have something on the discharge paperwork. And as I love to tell people, we had um, one of our first patients that we invited to come back to the clinic in 2012 uh, declined to come back to the clinic. She was not happy and did not want to see us and did not want to come to Vanderbilt anymore. And um, but we had made her an appointment. It was on the discharge paperwork with the clinic number. And seven years later, she called us and scheduled an appointment, was still having some trouble with sleep and, and post-traumatic uh, stress symptoms and um, and made an appointment and came to clinic and we got her hooked up with our support group. So, you know, as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time is today. Great, thank you. We have a couple additional questions coming through. The next one is, how often do you see patients in clinic and at what point do they essentially graduate from, from your clinic? Yeah, that's that's pretty variable too. The majority of patients will have only one visit. Uh, so that although we have yet to see somebody who had no needs, um, we are generally able to get things set up um, for continuing care in more than 50% of patients. So they don't have to keep coming back to our clinic because we really see ourselves as uh, what I like to call late goal-directed critical care. So we're just like the wrap up from the critical care and we're not trying to take over their primary care. Um, that being said, some people have a lot of needs um, that require subspecialty coordination and or they don't have a primary care doctor or they need to see Jim a couple of more times. So we really tailor it on a case by case basis. And so, like I said, somebody who very severe, like our, our lady who had flu ARDS and was on ECMO and needed a lot of help and didn't have a primary care physician or insurance, we've, we've followed her for a long time. Um, but mo the, you know, technically more than 50% will only have one visit. And some will have one or two visits with the whole team and then uh, transition either to some community health services or um, to peer support, et cetera. Yeah, and, and I would just add, um, you know, there are a lot of models. We, we can agree that, that turning the ICU recovery center into a de facto primary care, care clinic is not what we want to do, right? So, so I, I think everybody would agree with that. Um, I think if you have the resources to have a psychologist see these people over a sustained period of time, uh, if you can pull that off, more power to you. Um, that, that's a great model. Some of the things we do are less ambitious than we might uh, attempt if we had the resources. Um, but I do think the thing we want to avoid is, is becoming um, the default primary care provider, where a year later, if somebody needs an uh, antibiotic or something, you know, they're calling Carla. That's, that's not what we want. Great. Um, next question. Is nutrition status screening a part of your process or would it ever be? Yeah, nutrition is so important. And um, I do feel a little abashed that we don't have a comprehensive nutrition screening, but we do have, uh, we do specifically talk about weight loss from baseline uh, changes in swallowing, uh, taste, et cetera, and how these things can um, affect recovery. So when I talked about our median weight loss being 26 pounds from baseline, that is a lot of muscle. Um, a lot, I mean, a number of our patients are obese when they come into the ICU and there are better ways to lose 100 pounds. But if you're going to lose 100 pounds, what you need to gain back is muscle. And 
that is really difficult. So we, we do uh, do some screening based on their weight loss from baseline, their weight gain since they've left the hospital, um, some kind of high level nutritional counseling regarding protein intake, um, and um, just kind of a verbal screen for swallowing dysfunction because some people still have, I mean, that's pretty common after an intubation to have persistent swallowing dysfunction. So um, that's also quite variable. Some people are doing great. And then, you know, another, you know, person just had to have a patient that I saw um, a couple of weeks ago. He had failed his swallow study post hospitalization, still had his peg tube. He was really mad about it. He was really sad about it. And then he got stronger and ate a lot of protein and had another swallow study and it was good and got his peg out and everybody's happy. So um, it, it is extremely important. If, if, if a fairy godmother a came in on a, and, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> and gifted us a nutritionist, I would I would take him or her with two hands. Great. We have a couple additional questions. Next one is during the PICS clinic, clinic visit, what identifies someone for a referral to home health PT or outpatient PT? Do you find that people need these referrals often? Yeah, I'll say what, what we find the most is that people got these referrals at hospital discharge and they just haven't happened, um, which is extremely frustrating. And we, when we started the clinic, we had a lot of lofty goals of what we were going to do for people. And then when we found out like the super basic stuff, which just wasn't happening, like people weren't getting their IV antibiotics because their girlfriend broke up with them when they were in the hospital and they were sleeping on a friend's couch and home health couldn't find them and they still had a pick line, true story. Or you, they weren't getting their home PT because they didn't have a primary care physician to re receive the paperwork. So they were just lying in bed, t caring for their infant lying down because they couldn't walk. Also true story. Um, just like basic, basic stuff. So we do use that um, six minute walk test to kind of gauge where people are in their physical conditioning. And it's, I mean, there's nobody in the normal range. So pretty much everybody needs more physical therapy. And again, we tailor that based on their needs. Um, outpatient PT is something that we, we do prescribe a fair amount. Um, um, and we're just trying to get the home PT often, you know, like we're seeing people a few weeks after hospital discharge and home PT still hasn't come to their house for the first time. So, um, it, it's kind of a problem. I, I do like to tell patients, um, two things. So one is we, we started doing the six minute walk test out of intellectual curiosity to see if our clinical population was as weak as, as had been described by Margaret Harridge and others, as Joanna mentioned, um, and they are, but the um, the other interesting thing is that it became a, a a tool actually to counsel patients because everybody's weak, everybody needs more rehab, everybody's happy to be alive, and they don't want to do any, they don't want to go back to the hospital, they don't want to do PT, they just want to go to work and pretend that everything's fine. But when we tell them, hey, your six minute walk distance is 47% predicted, they're like, oh, that's terrible. I'm like, yeah, it's bad, it's severely reduced. And what's the treatment? More rehab. And then they're more motivated to, to do that rehab. And then we can repeat the six minute walk when the, if they come back a second time and see the improvement and that's gratifying and motivating, motivating for patients. Um, the other part of this is that what our system is set up to provide patients is barely the bare minimum of what is needed if your goal as a patient to is to return to your physical baseline, then you have to do a lot of rehab. And we had one one of our patients that I like I like to call her one of our super survivors because she did everything right without us, but she did come to clinic, but she would have done anything everything right either way. Um, and she was on the vent for three weeks on high dose steroids, so so weak she could not even move her finger to to reach the call light, which was very upsetting for her when she was in the hospital, went to an LTAC, went to inpatient rehab after the LTAC, went home with home rehab, home PT OT. And when her home PT ran out, she joined a gym and hired a trainer and worked with a trainer at the gym every single day for 180 days. <laughs> and I think that's probably what people need if they want to get all the way back to baseline, but that is not what our system provides for or even tells people that they need. 
Okay, we're about out of time. We do have two remaining questions. Are you okay with um, answering those two questions in the next couple of minutes? Awesome. Go ahead. Um, so the next question says, hi, great presentation. This is Sharon, a final year Mercer University student pharmacist on a critical care rotation at Wellstar Medical Center in Atlanta. Um, how do you manage patients who don't have insurance coverage for um, being seen in the PICS clinic? Um, so that's a great question. So do you mean uh, the patients like what Carl or Dr. Stephen already alluded to was that uh, unfortunately we can't see a lot of these patients. They don't even get to come to the clinic um, without insurance, which is a problem. Um, but if we do get them um, with regards to medications, it's kind of the same strategies, which honestly I've learned a ton about. Um, with regards to what you'd use in the hospital of like getting samples or we have something here at Vanderbilt called a MAP grant where you can fill that out and you get like a few, um, like a, a month supply of like a, a Pixaban, a Rivaroxaban, um, which wouldn't be uncommon. And uh, what uh, uh, Carla was alluding to when she was giving examples is, I feel like I can't even count on two hands how many people have gotten the MAP grant for the 30-day uh, supply of their anticoagulant and then they come to us and they're like, oh, I have two days left and they have no means uh, to get it. And so we've definitely, I think, made a huge impact there with filling out another grant for the patients to uh, to can get their full 90-day um, or however many uh, days they have to stay on that. So once they get in the clinic, it's a lot of the same strategies you would use inpatient as well, which are outpatient uh, uh, pulmonary pharmacist has helped me learn about because being a critical care pharmacist, I honestly don't have a ton of experience with that, and she's helped me tremendously with that. Yeah, and I'll say when you're setting up your programs, it behooves your hospital system to help these patients get their meds so they don't get readmitted because when they need to get readmitted or they run out of meds, they're going to come back to your ER and you're going to pick up that tab. So it'll be a lot cheaper to just give them their meds and keep them healthy and on the path to recovery. And um, yeah, I, the, the, the number of people who go home with two weeks of anticoagulation and then just come up against a brick wall is, is it's very upsetting. And our final question, do you ever refer patients to a registered dietitian if you see them to be at a high nutritional risk? Yes, yes, we have. And uh, we, use, we use both our dietitians and our, um, our speech therapists, which are fantastic uh, to help us with swallowing uh, evaluations in the outpatient setting. And that's very easy for us to do here. So if patients do have um, insurance coverage, or we do have some folks back to the resource issue um, who have some insurance pending that was started for them at, by case management when they were in the hospital, but then have a gap when they leave the hospital. Some of those folks, we can get charity assistance and that covers all their Vanderbilt uh, testing for a period of time. So yes, we do do that. One, uh, one quick follow-up comment uh, and I'll be very quick. So as, as Carla referenced, uh, some of our patients were morbidly obese to start with and they lost a huge amount of weight and and they're at a weight that they haven't been at perhaps for many, many years, and, and technically it's a healthier weight for them to be at. Um, for those of you on the call who are uh, dietitians, nutritionists, uh, nurses with a particular interest in that, whatever, I, I think this is a really crucial place to intervene because what's gonna happen is you've got, you've got a bit of a pregnant opportunity here, right? You've got a unique opportunity um, this person has lost this weight, not the right way. They've lost a lot of muscle, um, but 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 often they're open to feedback in a way they won't be. And if you intervene, you could really change the trajectory of their health. If you don't, you know, before long they're going back to eating um, Big Macs and uh, uh, you know whatever they are, I try to stay away from them these days. But, uh, you know, they're back to fast fooding it, to double fisting the burgers. And uh, they're going to gain that weight back and more, and they're going to feel very discouraged. So whether it is um, whether it is eating or whether it is habits like smoking, uh, this is the time to intervene, take these opportunities and try to leverage them to change the health outcomes of people. Great. Well, thank you so much to our speakers for being here today. I really enjoyed um, learning from you and you know, we all appreciate your time. And as a reminder for our attendees, our next Southeast chapter meeting is on Thursday, June 10th. Um, and it will be about sustaining wellness for healthcare providers, which I know is a, 
um, topic we could all use lately. Um, so thank you once again. I hope everyone um, enjoys the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.